any hard of hearing or deaf um, attendees. Um, we have ASL services right over here to my left, your right, next to the railing. Um, those are being provided for you. All right, so um, first of all, this is our first in-person event since uh, the, the 2020. So thank you for all showing up. I know some of you, you know, I forgot what it was like to have people attached to their bodies. I just used to see squares and heads on the screen. So it's nice to see everybody here. <clears throat> Um, so with that in mind, um, we'll go ahead and get our program started. So um, um, Ruben, um, I'm going to introduce Ruben Lopez. Um, you can introduce yourself and he's going to give us a couple things. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before we begin our program, I'd like to pay our respects to the original custodians of this land. Fulton College is located on the unceded ancestral lands shared by the Gabrielino, Hongba Nation, and the Wanyanyo Band of Mission Indians, a Hashiman Nation, who have been the traditional caretakers since time immemorial. From the water defenders defying the building of the Keystone XL pipeline to the Warani protesting deforestation in the Peruvian Amazon, Native communities across the globe continue to fight to protect the environment, and they continue to pay a heavy toll. A report released by Global Witness in 2022 counted 227 environmental activists killed in 2020, an undercount as a reported number relies on the level of transparency, freedom of press, and civil rights in individual countries. Indigenous communities make up only about 5% of the world's population, yet bore the brunt of the anti-activist violence, accounting for more than a third of those killed. In California, Native communities are vital in helping to train firefighting agencies in more effective wildland techniques, uh, firefighting techniques, moving from fire suppression to prescribed burns in order to prevent larger, more destructive wildfires. Society has much to learn from their accumulated knowledge. I also like to thank other contributing uh, departments, including the geography department, uh, and specifically my colleague, Eleni Gregorio, Tyler Deasy, our Interim Director of Sustainability on our campus, Megan Moscow, our Co-Chair and Festival Coordinator, as well as all the other members of our sustainability community here on campus. Earth Day began as a direct response to the fossil fuel industry damaging the California coast. On January 28th, 1969, a massive oil spill occurred on the coast of Santa Barbara. Three to four million gallons of oil spread out over 35 miles and is still ranked as the largest oil spill to occur off the California coast. The environmental movement existed before 1969, but it was fragmented and without a focused identity. Santa Barbara caught the focus of the nation and tapped into societal energies swirling around environmental concerns, civil rights, and protests against America's involvement in Vietnam. 20 million Americans, 1,500 colleges and universities, 10,000 schools participated in Earth Day 1970, focused on activism rather than simply a celebration. The political wave helped to create support for the creation of the EPA in 1970, the National Environmental Policy Act 1970, the Clean Water Act of 1972, the creation of the California Coastal Commission of 1972, and the California Environmental Quality Act of 1970, among others. Unfortunately, 50 plus years after Santa Barbara, uh, progress on some environmental issues, especially those related to climate change, have stagnated. I'd like now to give the mic back to my colleague, Professor De Jesus, to give you a little bit of a snapshot on where we stand on climate change today. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Actually, I have one quick announcement from the Associated Students. Um, this is related to, uh, this is coming from Chloe Serrano, the Associated Students President, and Isaac, the Vice President. Hi everyone, I'm the current Associated Students President. My name's Chloe Serrano. And I'm your current Vice President, Isaac Choi. 
Um, we just wanted to come here and encourage everyone to vote. We currently have a spring election going on. So this will mean everybody that is currently running right now will be for our spring, I mean, for our next year's executive board. For those of you who are interested in joining associated students, you can find any information on as.fullcall.edu. Um, associated students is the megaphone that students use to project their voices and concerns to make genuine change on campus. That includes climate change as well. Um, we have a CDO committee, the sustainability committee that Professor De Jesus is co-chair of. Um, you can join committees like that as a senator and fight the good fight. <laughs> That's it, thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Isaac. It's nice to see students involved. Um, as remember, Earth Day started on college campuses um, in, um, primarily by student um, um, activism. Okay, so I just kind of want to give you an update on our current state of climate change. Um, in 2020, Earth's average temperature was more than, it was one degree Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels. And that's a result of increased um, atmospheric CO2. Um, in 2023, our most recent measurement of atmospheric CO2 is uh, 420 ppm. That is up from 417 a year ago and up uh, from 314 when the original measurements were made in 1958. So what are we doing? Well, in 2015, um, the Paris Agreement was signed at the of parties um, agreeing to try to limit climate change to two degrees Celsius, um, that is above average. Um, however, efforts have been made to keep that below 1.5, um, and in particular the slogan 1.5 to stay alive. However, in 2022, uh, the United Nations Environmental Program uh, released a report saying 1.5, uh, there was no critical or excuse me, there was no credible pathway to 1.5 degrees. So hopefully um, efforts uh, that will be underway will limit um, uh, uh, um, climate change to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. So that is a sobering kind of um, um, perspective on current climate change. Um, one uh, positive is last year um, in 2022, we were only 0.9 degrees above uh, the mid 20th century average. So down a little bit, but I believe uh, the, the next year or two, uh, we will exceed that um, due to different weather patterns. All right, so with that in mind, um, although we see um, the slide up here uh, from 1988 related to greenhouse gases and climate change, um, our speaker today is Dr. Naomi Oreskes. She's um, going to talk a little bit about that, but actually focus a little bit more on the information surrounding climate and climate change. So Dr. Naomi Oreskes joins us from Harvard University. Um, she is the Charles Lee Professor of History Science and Affiliated Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences. She received her bachelor's um, from Imperial College London um, and wait, later went on to Stanford University to obtain her PhD. Um, after stops at Dartmouth and New York University, she joined the faculty at UC San Diego in 1993. That's my alma mater, so nice to see that. Um, and then in 2013, Dr. Reskes joined Harvard University. So Dr. Oreskes has published more than 60 uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, 20 chapters in edited volumes, eight books, and two edited volumes. She's a, a member, among others, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences um, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has testified in front of Congress uh, numerous times on climate change and writes, currently writes a monthly column in Scientific American. Her TED Talk, Why We Should Trust Scientists, has more than one and a half million views. Dr. Zareski's research focuses on the history of science and the relationship between science and society. She's interested in the history of science communication and the role of media in shaping public understanding of science. She's a leading voice on the reality of anthropogenic climate change and the history of efforts to undermine, undermine climate action and scientific truth. Um, more, um, among her books, Dr. Zareski's wrote the um, introduction to the Papal Encyclical on climate change and inequality, Laudato Si. And her books include The Big Myth, which we will hear about today, uh, Merchants of Doubt, um, and Why Trust Science. 
So please join me um, in giving Dr. Reskes a warm welcome from Fullerton College. Well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here and kind of an honor to be your first live uh, talk after COVID. It's been a rough run for a lot of us, so it's really nice to be here with you in person. So as you heard, I'm going to talk to you mostly today about my new book, The Big Meth Myth, but we're going to start with climate change because that's the issue that got me interested in disinformation and in people who deliberately try to make us distrust science. So my story begins, as you just heard, in 1988. 1988, that's the year when Jim Hansen, the climate scientist from NASA, first testified in the US Congress that man-made climate change was underway. And underscoring the man-made part of this, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, well, we know there's climate change, but we don't really know what's causing it. No, we do. We've known since the 1980s that it was caused by people, and we've known since the 1980s, hmm, doesn't look like this works, but... Oh, no, there it is. I just can't see well. That what drives climate change is burning fossil fuels. This is not a secret. It's not a scientific mystery. It's something that we have known for a long time. Now, it was partly Hansen's testimony and work related to it that led to a global convention to stop climate change, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed by the leaders of 195 countries in 1992. The Paris Agreements that uh, Professor De Jesus just referred to is an agreement that is a um, um, protocol to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So this has the status of international law. And the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change committed the signatories to preventing, quote, dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. President George Bush signed that convention uh, and called on the world leaders to translate the written document into concrete action to the protect the planet. So that was 31 years ago. That's longer than most of you students have been alive on this planet. So what the heck happened? Why didn't we act on the science? Why didn't we take those concrete steps that President George H.W. Bush promised. President Bush, a Republican president. So in our previous work, Eric Conway and I showed that the answer was not for lack of scientific information or lack of clear communication. In fact, what we showed was that the emergence of the scientific consensus on climate change in the late 1980s triggered a politically motivated campaign to cast doubt upon the science and to block political action. In other words, this wasn't an accident. So that today, climate change has become the climate crisis. So this is the story that Eric and I told in our first book together, Merchants of Doubt, now published 13 years ago, a story about a cadre of scientists who cast doubt, not just on climate science, but on the, scientific issue, the science related to a set of issues, including the harms of tobacco, the reality of acid rain, the threat of ozone depletion. And so the question we wanted to answer was, why? Why would educated, intelligent people deny basic scientific fa facts? And especially about something as well established as the harms of tobacco or as consequential as the ozone hole. The answer we found was not so much money as politics. Science denial had nothing to do with the science. That is to say, it wasn't based on problems in the science, like inadequate data or uncertain models, but it had everything to do with political ideology, the ideology of market fundamentalism. And so we wanted to understand what is market fundamentalism? Where did it come from? And why did it motivate so many people to reject climate science? So market fundamentalism is best defined as a belief in, quote, the magic of the marketplace and the power and efficiency of what's often referred to as the free market. And it's coupled to hostility to government action in the marketplace, especially government regulation. Market fundamentalists argue that government needs to, quote, get out of the way and to let markets do their magic. One clear example of this way of thinking and how it motivates science denial involves tobacco. 
So one of the original merchants of doubt was a man named S. Fred Singer, who was a physicist, and in fact, he was a proverbial rocket scientist. He was the director of the National Weather Satellite Service uh, in the 1960s and 70s. But in the 1990s, Singer worked with the Philip Morris Tobacco Company to challenge the evidence of the harms of secondhand smoke. Now, by this time, secondhand smoke had been shown by overwhelming scientific evidence to kill hundreds of thousands of people every year just here in the United States and many more in other countries, including infants and young children. So why would anyone defend it? Why would anyone defend a product that killed infants? Well, he answered that question in his own words. He wrote, quote, if we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there is essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. If we allow the government to compromise freedom, like the freedom to smoke, Singer argued, then we risk losing all freedom. So it's a slippery slope argument. And therefore, he and his colleagues argued that even seemingly good regulations, like restrictions on smoking, are actually bad. They put us on a slippery slope to government control of our lives and in his mind, specifically Soviet-style communism or totalitarianism. Now, the market fundamentalists argue that this could be deliberate. So they often refer to environmentalists as watermelons, green on the outside, but red on the inside. And you'll see this accusation being made a lot even today, that environmentalists are really socialists. But this would explain then why a scientific issue like tobacco or carbon pollution got politicized because of this assertion that it was hiding a political agenda. But the market fundamentalists also argue that sometimes this could be inadvertent, that liberal do-gooders trying to do good, like protect children from tobacco smoke, um, will actually do harm. And they actually hate this even more, because they think that well-meaning well -meaning people will end up doing damage. So this was the argument they made to justify defending the tobacco industry and challenging the evidence of climate change. And so we wanted to know, well, where did market fundamentalism come from? Where did this argument come from? And why did so many people accept it so strongly that they would reject well-established scientific evidence of serious harms like tobacco-based death and disease and the damages of climate disruption? And why would they reject the need for government action to address these really serious, deadly problems? So this is the story that we try to tell, the questions we try to answer in our new book, The Big Myth. It's a history of conscious programs by a kind of consortium of American business leaders to promote market fundamentalism as a way to prevent government regulation of these industries, and to do it by promoting this ideology in academia, in public education, in popular culture, and in politics. Now, it's a big book. If you've seen copies floating around, you'll know that we cover a lot of things. So I won't um, try to cover them all today, although I'll try to cover a fair amount. Um, but what we show in the book is that industry groups and conservative business leaders used the same strategies throughout the 20th century, the same strategies that we documented in Merchants of Doubt, to limit government protections for labor, including child labor, to prevent or limit regulation of dangerous industries, including tobacco and fossil fuels, to protect the private sector from responsibility for the costs, the external costs of their product, like air pollution and climate change, to persuade us that the American way of life is bound to free enterprise, to argue that any compromise to economic freedom threatens our political freedom, and culminating in the election of Ronald Reagan and, his, and the remaking of the Republican Party to turn against government, culminating in Reagan's famous slogan, the government is not a solution to our problems, government is the problem, and therefore handicapping us in using the tools of government to address these very severe and important problems. Now, as I've said, telling the story of this big myth required a big book, so what I want to focus on today is a portion of the history, a portion that invites us to consider how we have come to rely too much on markets and not enough on government to address real and significant economic and social needs.
So let me start by saying a little bit more about what the myth is. Like all good myths, the big myth embeds several sub-myths. The first sub-myth is the idea of the free market. The idea that there is something that we can meaningfully refer to as the free market, that it exists unto itself, that it has agency and even wisdom. So if you think about the idea of the invisible hand of the marketplace, it has this somewhat godlike character. The reality, of course, is that there is no such thing as the free market. People make markets. Markets are human institutions. They've been around since biblical times, and people have been setting the rules under which they operate for just as long. There is no such thing as the free market, and there never has been. The second sub-myth is that government cannot improve the functioning of markets. It can only interfere. Governments, therefore, should stay out of the way, lest they, quote, distort the market and prevent it from doing its magic. The reality is that governments have always been involved in markets. In fact, in many cases, governments have created markets, like the markets for railroads or rural electrification. Or governments have improved their functioning when they didn't work well, or fill needs that markets have left unfilled. And the third part of the myth, and the one that actually is most relevant for explaining climate change denial, is something that we call the indivisibility thesis. It's the claim that capitalism and freedom are indivisible, that they're two sides of the same coin, and therefore any compromise to economic freedom, even for a seemingly good cause, like protecting children, threatens political freedom, and therefore the government needs to stand back and let the market do its magic. So you can see these different submits all reinforce the same basic idea, which is let the market do its magic. Government needs to stand back. The reality, of course, is that history has on multiple occasions proved this to be untrue, and I'll come back to this point at the end of my talk. So what I want to focus on today is this key argument linking capitalism and freedom an argument that has been central to American conservative and anti-scientific ideology since the 1930s and continues to inform it today. So the story begins in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago, with ex-president Herbert Hoover. As most of you know, Hoover lost the US presidency to Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932, and most people thought this was, or many people view him as a discredited president because of his failure to act to alleviate the Great Depression. So when Hoover was in office, the Great Depression had put millions of Americans out of work. About a quarter of the workforce was formerly unemployed and probably another quarter was underemployed. People were on bread lines. People were leaving Oklahoma to come to California. The economy was in free fall. And Hoover said, well, just wait and let the, ma markets, let the markets do their magic. Let them correct themselves. And so he lost the election to FDR. But many people think that Hoover just kind of disappeared after that, but that's not true. He remained highly influential in Republican Party, conservative, and business circles. And in 1934, he wrote a book that really helped to frame how conservatives thought about how they would fight back against FDR, against the, the New Deal, and against progressive reform. And it was a book called The Challenge to Liberty. And in this book, he offered what, as far as we can tell, is the first articulation of the indivisibility thesis. He says, quote, it holds both in principle and in world experience that intellectual and spiritual freedoms cannot thrive except there were there are also economic freedoms. It insists equally upon protections to all of these freedoms or there is no liberty at all. This idea was taken up by a group of industrialists led by, um, particularly by a man named J. Howard Pugh, who was the president of the Sun Oil Corporation, what we know today as Sunoco, and a leader in a trade organization known as the National Association of Manufacturers. In the 1920s, NAM had fought against child labor laws, so laws to protect children from labor. And in the 1930s, it launched a multi-million dollar propaganda campaign targeted at teachers, at ministers and other community leaders and ordinary American citizens to promote the indivisibility thesis. They did this through press releases, push polls, integration propaganda, films, newsletters, magazines, cartoons, classrooms, and factory posters, pretty much anything you can think about or imagine they did. And I should point out that NAM still exists today, 
and they have been a major player in fighting climate policy and the regulation of carbon pollution. So what was the central argument? In 1939, NAM put forward, packaged the indivisibility thesis under a metaphor they called the tripod of freedom. And they, in a declaration of principles, they said, quote, in a world torn by war and dictatorship, Americans live at peace and in freedom. The best assurance that we shall remain free and at peace is our own internal unity and strength tied to our faith in constitutional representative government, in free enterprise, and in civil and religious liberty as inseparable fundamentals of freedom to be cherished and preserved. So there you have it, the tripod of freedom. The metaphor of the tripod insists on the idea that if any one of leg of the tripod was compromised, then the whole structure would tumble. Therefore, they argued, it's essential to promote free enterprise in order to maintain political freedom and democracy. So in other words, if the New Deal restricted what business people could do, the whole structure of American democracy would fall. Now, the tripod of freedom was promoted in various formats and venues, but most aggressively and probably most successfully in a syndicated radio program extolling the virtues of capitalism and vilifying FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, and the New Deal. It was called The American Family Robinson, and it was based loosely on the, the book, The Swiss Family Robinson, which you may remember was based on a family that is shipwrecked on an island, but they survive through dint of hard work and individual enterprise. According to NAM's own documents, the program's purpose was to present, quote, openly and as effectively and attractively as radio will permit, the fundamental principle that freedom of speech and of the press, freedom of religion and freedom of enterprise are inseparable and must continue to be if the system of democratic government under which this country has flourished is to be preserved. It was J. Howard Pugh then who suggested the idea of, of these freedoms being indivisible, from which we get this idea of the indivisible thesis. In 1948, he wrote a letter to the libertarian writer Rose Wilder Lane. And Rose Wilder Lane is interesting. She's mostly forgotten from history but she was actually the ghostwriter to her mother, Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, and the Little House on the Prairie book series. Most of us uh, know of that story, that those stories that were promoted as the true life story of Laura Ingalls Wilder's life growing up on the American frontier, but they weren't actually true stories. They were actually written by her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, who was a libertarian friend of Herbert Hoover, friend of J. Howard Pugh, um, and who recast them as libertarian parables of surviving by the dint of your own um, effort and really expunging the role of the federal government in indigenous removals in the Homestead Act and also effacing the fact that the true story of the family was actually a story of failure, not success. So what did J. Howard Pugh say to Rose Wilder Lane? He wrote, quote, I believe that freedom is indivisible. When a part is taken away, that which remains is no longer freedom. To illustrate, suppose we should lose our industrial freedoms. Then it would require a compulsory form of government in order to enforce the decrees having to do with the conduct of industry, and a compulsory state can brook no freedoms. So you see a kind of slippery slope argument developing. Government begins to regulate some piece of industry, like through a minimum wage or an eight-hour day, and the next thing you know, we're living under a totalitarian dictatorship. So this was the argument they put forward. But they faced three problems. The first problem was that it wasn't true. Free enterprise is not part of a tripod of freedom that can be traced back to the founding of the United States. In fact, the term free enterprise appears nowhere in the Declaration of Independence, nowhere in the Constitution, nowhere in the Bill of Rights. And in fact, the federal and state governments were deeply involved in the American economy throughout history. The 19th century was not characterized dominantly by free enterprise. It was characterized by a very high level of government engagement in the economy. Second, it was hypocritical. Nam, Pugh, and Herbert Hoover all argued for businessmen's freedom to set wages and working hours in their factories, but they fought bitterly and sometimes violently against workers' freedom to unionize and engage in collective bargaining. And it was self-serving. Indeed, they even recognized as much. 
In the 1940s, memories of the Depression were still vivid and bitter. As historian Wendy Wall has noted, in the wake of the economic collapse, the free fall of capitalism that was the Great Depression, quote, the narrative of capitalist-driven growth seemed questionable at best, a monstrous delusion at worst. So what was the solution? How would these industrialists take this hypocritical, self-serving, and false argument and make anyone believe it? Well, we're at a university, a college, so you know the answer. It is recruit academics. Recruit intellectuals to bolster the case, make it seem credible. And so they did. So in the 1940s, American business leaders recruited two very important economists from Europe. They were Ludwig von Hayek and Ludwig, sorry, Friedrich von Hayek and Ludwig von Mises. These men were the founders or two of the founders of the Austrian School of Economics, better known to us today as neoliberalism. These positions, their views were not well known in the United States at this time. They were not widely accepted, but these businessmen would work then over the next several decades to make these ideas more well known and accepted. And they did this in a number of ways. First, they worked behind closed doors to get these men jobs at American universities, Mises at NYU, and Hayek at the University of Chicago. Then they produced simplified versions of their arguments and promoted them heavily in popular culture, and then funded additional academics, particularly at the Chicago School of Economics, to refine the argument and to carry it forward. So a key part of this story involved the, a book called The Road to Serfdom. How many of you have heard of this book? Not very many. So that shows there are probably not too many listeners of Fox News in this audience, because if you watch Fox News, you will often see this book promoted. It's one of the most influential texts of conservative thinking in the second half of the 20th century. It was published in 1944, right at the end of World War II, and it was a sophisticated articulation of the indivisibility thesis. It was focused on Soviet communism and the risks of centralized planning. And the argument was that a centrally planned economy necessarily has to be totalitarian because there's no way the government can control the economy without also controlling the people in it. And up to a point, that argument had a certain force. It wasn't crazy or foolish. But Hayek then went much further. And he argued that even in a non-communist society like the United Kingdom, where he was living at that time, if economic freedom were compromised, for example, by creating a national health service, it would only be a matter of time before that society was on the road to serfdom. So it's the very slippery slope argument that I suggested motivated climate change denial as well. Now, that said, Hayek was a sophisticated thinker, and he allowed for some important exceptions. He wrote, the successful use of competition, so he means here free market principles, as the principle of social organization precludes certain types of coercive interference with economic life, but it admits of and even requires others. And if you read the book, you find that actually he gives many examples of where, quote, coercive interference in the marketplace is actually legitimate. So, for example, it's perfectly fine to put signposts on roads. Um, it's fine for the government to work to prevent harmful effects of deforestation, of some methods of farming, or the noise and smoke of factories. It's also acceptable to prohibit the use of certain poisonous substances or to require special precautions in their use, to limit working hours, to enforce sanitary conditions in workplaces, to control weights and measures, and to prevent violent strikes. Hayek also argued for some form of social insurance or social welfare programs similar to what today we call social security. He wrote, there can be no question that adequate security against severe privation and the reduction of avoidable causes of misdirected effort and consequent disappointment will have to be one of the main goals of policy. One of the main goals of policy. And he explicitly rejected the argument for laissez-faire capitalism. He wrote, it is important not to confuse opposition against planning, and by that he means central planning, with a dogmatic laissez-faire attitude. The liberal argument is in favor of making the best possible use of the forces of competition as a means of coordinating human efforts 
not an argument for leaving things just as they are. So that's a pretty interesting, sophisticated, and nuanced argument. But in the hands of his American acolytes, it in fact became an argument for leaving things just as they are. It became an argument against social security, against laws to prevent pollution, um, against social security. In fact, it took on the quality of religious faith, and this is why we call it market fundamentalism. So Hayek's uh, backers in the United States loved the road to serfdom. They thought the message was exactly what they believed in, but they also thought the book was too intellectual, too highbrow for American audiences. So what did they do? They arranged to, for the creation of a Reader's Digest condensed version, and they took a book that's about oh, I can't remember, 250, 300 pages, and condensed it to 20 pages. Um, and by doing that, eliminated all of the caveats, all of the discussion about pollution or social security that are in the original text. Moreover, they accompany the text by this diagram. And what you can see is that this is a kind of, well, what they call political and economic rights, a kind of 10 commandments, although well, I think there's actually 15 but a kind of Ten Commandments of Economic and Political Rights, including the right to freedom from government regulation and control. And you can see this is all then said to be premised on a fundamental belief in God. So it's linking free market capitalism and the indivisible thesis to Christianity, to a Christian belief. Well, in this case, to any belief in God, but elsewhere in the book we show how it's not actually any belief in God, it's actually Protestantism. And then they went even further. They turned it into a comic book, a literal cartoon published in 1945 in Look magazine, which was a mass market magazine that no longer exists, but some of the older folks in the audience will remember it, and a pamphlet that was distributed in millions of copies by General Motors Corporation. The cartoon had only a tiny amount of text. It was essentially 18 pictures and captions, and it reduces the whole argument into the slippery slope argument. So it begins with the government mobilization of the war, of the economy during the war, something that nearly everyone agreed was necessary. Um, and it ends with a firing squad executing a political dissident. So we start with the war economy, we start with the New Deal mobilizing the country for World War II, and we end up with a totalitarian dictatorship. Now, we know from his own account that in the 1950s, Ronald Reagan, Reagan read Friedrich Fahak. We're guessing that he probably read the Reader's Digest version or maybe even the cartoons. We know that these popularizations reached a huge audience. The original book, The Road to Serfdom, had sold 17,000 copies, and that was much more than its editors expected. But the Look magazine version was distributed to 2.9 million subscribers. Reader's Digest had a circulation of nearly 9 million, and we know that a million more copies were distributed by General Motors. So just for comparison, the U.S. population at that time was 140 million, so they may well have reached close to 10% of the American population. And as I've already said, all of Hayek's nuance, all of his caveats, all of his discussion of the legitimate forms of, quote, interference, that is to say government regulation, were all removed. And then they did the same thing to Adam Smith. So many of you had not heard of Friedrich Wacke Hayek, but how many of you, who here has not heard of Adam Smith? No one. Okay, one person, two people. Well, I'm going to tell you in a minute why Adam Smith is important. So in the later part of the 1940s, uh, these same businessmen who had brought von Hayek and von Mises to America established something they called the Free Market Project at the University of Chicago. Hayek had been brought to America in part as part of a vision that would include this larger project, that it wouldn't just be about his book, but that would support a whole body of research by reputable economists to promote the idea that the United States should depend on the free market and resist government action, government regulation. It was funded by a former executive at the DuPont Corporation, a man by the name of Jasper Crane, and Howard Lunau, who was the head of the Libertarian Volcker Foundation, America's first libertarian foundation. Now, just to show how all these people are interconnected, 
Train himself was heavily influenced by Rose Wilder Lane, who I was just speaking of a moment ago. This is a collection of letters between Rose Wilder Lane and Jasper Crane. Um, and the idea was that they would fund an academic program at a prestigious university to develop what they called a blueprint for, quote, an effective competitive system of free enterprise. In fact, in their letters, they specifically say, the communists have Das Kapital, the Nazis have Mein Kampf, and we need the Bible of market fundamentalism. And that's what this project was designed to produce. But this was not open inquiry. It was not an open, there was no open competition for these jobs. They didn't advertise the jobs. They identified specific people whose views were compatible with the arguments and arranged to hire them and bring them to Chicago. So to collect a cadre of libertarian oriented economists to build the arguments and give them academic uh, credibility. Um, and it wasn't a case of go do research and find what you find. No, the primacy of the free market as the most efficient organizer of society was determined in advance. And the goal was to explain, quote, that the free market is systematic, rational, not chaotic or disorderly, and consistently efficient in, quote, allocating resources to their best use. And in the book, we talk about this in greater detail. We did a lot of work to try to figure out, well, where is the research that proves that markets are efficient? Because almost all of us have been raised to think, yes, markets are inefficient. Gov markets are efficient. Government is inefficient. Markets are effective. Government is wasteful. So where is the work that proves this. And it turns out it's almost impossible. Well, it is just about impossible to find. In fact, we found one paper by a famous economist where he says, yeah, it's actually kind of interesting that you can't actually point to a body of literature that proves this, but it must be true because everyone believes it. So it shows how propaganda can insinuate itself into our thinking. So we come to believe something that has never actually been shown to be true. And the second part, of course, was to emphasize this alleged relationship between capitalism and freedom with an emphasis on regulation as, quote, a menace to the free market and therefore to freedom generally. So the funders stipulated these ideas as what this research was going to prove. So as I've already said, these champions of competition did not actually support competition in academic life. Uh, there was no open search for these jobs, no competitive process for funding, no call for proposal. Rather, they handpicked the participants, they got them hired behind closed doors, and without any external reviews, they funded the research that supported their political ideology. So who were these participants? Well, it's a big project. I don't have time tonight to talk about all aspects of it, but in the book we do. But two of the key figures were two famous and important economists who would later win the Nobel Memorial Prize in economics, George Stigler on the left, and Milton Friedman on the right. In 1957, Stigler published an edited version of Adam Smith's classic book, The Wealth of Nations. So for those of you who don't know Adam Smith, Adam Smith is generally considered to be the father of capitalism. This book is the single most influential, well, one of the single most influential books ever written on any topic, definitely the single most influential book ever written on economics, and it lays out a blueprint for how capitalism could function and work in Europe at this time, how it could and should replace the previous economic system, which is mercantilism. And I should interrupt myself here and say, sometimes people ask me, you know, do I think we should replace capitalism with something else, and if so, what? And that's a giant question, and I don't know the answer to it. But one thing I do like to point out is sometimes people act as if there is no alternative to capitalism, that it, it's the only possible economic system, forgetting that actually we've had many economic systems before that. I'm not defending mercantilism, I'm not defending feudalism, but the fact is capitalism replaced something else, and The Wealth of Nations is a book arguing for that replacement, for a different kind of economic system. So this is a profoundly influential book, it's one that is quoted all the time, although it's a thousand pages long and there's probably like three sentences that are quoted over and over and over again. And here's the key point that explains why that is. Just as the edited version of The Road to Serfdom left out all of Hayek's caveats, so the Chicago School of version of The Wealth of Nations did the same thing to Adam Smith. 
Now, The Wealth of Nations is a giant book. And some things would obviously have to be left out if you're going to try to do an edited volume that you could use in an undergraduate classroom. But it's pretty conspicuous what Stigler leaves out because he leaves out all of the passages, all of the passages where Smith recognizes the limits of self-interest, the limits of competition, and the need for governments to have taxation, regulation, and restraints on self-interest uh, to protect public safety. So again, I don't have time to talk in detail about all of these things, but many people are surprised to find out that Adam Smith has an extensive discussion of the need for banking regulation, much in the news today. He has an extensive discussion of why you need taxes to support public goods like roads and bridges and ports. He has an extensive discussion of the need for minimum wage and the rights and importance, the necessity of workers to unionize to counter the power of factory owners. That's not the Adam Smith that most of us were taught in school. So let me give you one example, the example of banking regulation. In The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith offers an extensive discussion, many, many pages, a whole uh, chapter, uh, section of the book, of why an effective capitalist system requires banking regulation and how without it, the self-interest of bankers could lead to bank runs and wreck the economy, which is, of course, exactly why the FDIC stepped in a few weeks ago to, to rescue the Silicon Valley Bank, because that bank, pursuing its own self-interest, created a situation that led to a run on the bank and the risk that that would then spread to runs on other banks and that the entire U.S. banking system could collapse. That's why the FDIC stepped in a few weeks ago, just as they did during the Great Depression. It's why the FDIC was created in the first place. And Adam Smith wholly endorses this 270 years ago. So why? What is his account for why you must have regulation? He's not saying it's just something you might want to think about. He's saying you cannot have an effective capitalist system without it. So here's why. So in the late 18th century, many banks issued currency in the form of paper. So today we take it for granted that only the government issues you know, money, but that wasn't true in the 18th century. Banks issued their own money and it had to be redeemable for gold and silver. So you could go to the bank with your paper money and get back a coin of a bag of silver coins. And this was good. It was good for the economy. Paper currency was far more convenient than having to walk around with bags of metal coins. And it would work so long as the banks carried sufficient reserves of gold and silver to satisfy customer demand. So if I come in and I say, oh, I, I want to redeem my paper, the bank has got to be able to do that. If it doesn't do it, then I panic, I tell my friends, and we've, next thing you know, we've got to run on the bank. But in Scotland, where Smith was actually originally from, the number of banks issuing paper money had grown hugely, and the Scottish economy had boomed. But many of these banks did not carry adequate reserves. And if people knew this, he argued, it would lead to a run on banks. So you needed some kind of rules and regulations about bank reserves then as we do today. But in a worst case scenario, if you didn't have those rules, the banks would fail, depositors would go bankrupt, even if they had done nothing wrong. So the self-interest of, of the bank is to have as minimal reserves as possible, but that puts everyone else in danger. So through no fault of my own, I could lose all my money because of someone else pursuing their self-interest. So untrammeled self-interest doesn't actually work. And this is Adam Smith saying so. But there was also another problem. Because paper money was of no use abroad, British merchants with excess paper were returning it to the Bank of England in London, which was obligated to buy gold and silver to redeem that paper money. This drove up the price of the metals, forcing the bank to pay higher costs to make coinage of the same market value. A shilling was still a shilling, but the silver needed to make it cost more. So the bank lost money, again, through no fault of its own. Smith wrote, the Scotch banks paid dearly for their own imprudence and inattention, but the Bank of England paid very dearly, not only for its own imprudence, but for the much greater imprudence of almost all the Scottish banks. In other words, Scottish self-interest was hurting English bankers. And so he concludes, you need to regulate the banks. Now, Smith knew that some observers would object to any regulation as a denial of freedom, just as they did in the 20th century, as I've just told you. 
So in response, he offered a succinct summary of when regulation is warranted. He wrote, quote, when the natural liberty of a few individuals endangers the security of the whole society. In other words, if my self-interest puts you all at risk, then you have a right to tell me you can't do that. And reckless bankers did put everyone at risk. And so he concluded, quote, the obligation of building firewalls in order to prevent the communication of fire is a violation of natural liberty exactly of the same kind with which the regulations of banking trade here are proposed. In other words, regulations are justified and necessary when the actions of some individuals threatens the freedom, safety, or security of the rest of us. Jo Jacob Viner, one of the founders of the Chicago School of Economics, one of the economists who was there before the development of the free market project, wrote, quote, the modern advocate of laissez-faire who objects to government participation in business on the grounds that it is an encroachment upon a field reserved by nature for private enterprise cannot find support for that argument in the wealth of nations. So why don't more of us know this? Why do we think of Adam Smith as an advocate of untrammeled self-interest? And why, if you read the Wall Street Journal or the Forbes or Fortunes, you constantly see Adam Smith's famous line about self-interest being quoted over and over again as if he thought that was the end of the story. Well, I think the answer is because this is the version of Adam Smith that the later Chicago School of Economics created and sustained and promoted in American academic life. And that brings me to the work of a second key figure in this project and the last one I'll speak about tonight, the economist Milton Friedman. In 1962, Milton Friedman, who had been hired as part of the Free Market, free market Project, published a book called Capitalism and Freedom. It was, in essence, of a restatement of the road to serfdom, and in the introduction, he acknowledges his debt to Hayek, but rewritten for an American audience. It was based on a series of lectures funded by the Volcker Fund, so the same people who had brought uh, Mises and Hayek to America, and it was, in effect, the blueprint for an effective competitive system of free enterprise that Crane and Leno had planned and paid for. Its central argument was that, quote, the great threat to freedom is the concentration of power. So by distributing power, the marketplace protects freedom. And therefore, he claims capitalism protects freedom and compromises to capitalism threaten freedom. It's very well summarized in a review of the book that was published in 1963 by a liberal economist, Leon Kaserling, who had been the head of President Truman's Council on Economic Advisors. He wrote, quote, freedom is said by Milton Friedman to depend above all, to depend above all upon limiting the functions of government as closely as possible. In other words, it was the indivisibility thesis. Or put another way, Friedman took the tripod of Friedman, freedom from the 1930s and reduced it to an even simpler claim for the 1960s that capitalism and freedom are the same thing, that capitalism is freedom. Now, if you're not yourself conservative or libertarian, you may not know just how influential these books have been. And if you are a conservative, then I urge you to stay with me. Because Road to Serfdom has been touted by many of America's most prominent conservative voices, people like Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh, The National Review, Tucker Carlson, Ted Cruz, Michelle Bachman, Paul Ryan, and many, many more. And I have to say, I'm a little suspicious that Michelle Bachman ever read this book, because in an interview she said she read it on the beach. And if you've read Hayek, you know that he is not beach reading. But nevertheless, the point is there. Hayek was invited to the White House by both Presidents Bush and Reagan, and in 1991 received the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom. President George H.W. Bush called The Road to Serfdom a book that, quote, still thrills readers everywhere, proving that he was a weird guy. Uh, it's an interesting book. I don't think most people would say it was thrilling. And Hayek was also awarded the Nobel Prize, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 1974. But Capitalism and Freedom, Milton Friedman's book, was even more influential. It was first published in 1962, and it is still in print today. It has sold more than half a million copies with multiple editions and 18 translations. It's on nearly every top 10 list of most important conservative books ever written. 
It's in the many lists of the top 100 books of all time, including Time and the Times Literary Supplement. So not just conservative lists, but liberal lists too. He became an editor for Newsweek magazine, where he wrote hundreds of editorials. He became an advisor to Margaret Thatcher and to Ronald Reagan. And in 1966, he also won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science. By the 1980s, Friedman had become one of the most prominent public intellectuals of the 20th century, in part because of a television series broadcast on public television called Free to Choose. But where did this television series come from? It, too, was funded by libertarian businessmen. At this point now, another generation of business people has stepped up to the plate, and this one was funded by a libertarian businessman in Pennsylvania named Bob Chichester. He supported not just the TV series, but a full-fledged campaign, a marketing campaign, including a companion book to explain the benefits of capitalism and political freedom to the world, and a foundation called the, quote, Free to Choose Network. And Friedman was awarded both the National Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. Today, Friedman's ideas continue to be promulgated by a large network of so-called free market think tanks and foundations. This is just a short list. Uh, my original list was so big that if I put them all on a slide, the font would be so small you couldn't um, read it. But it includes groups like the Heartland Institute that has accused climate scientists of being the equivalent of terrorists, um, the Cato Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, who have attacked me personally. Um, all of these institutes, every one of them, promotes free market solutions to social and environmental problems, and nearly all of them have denied the scientific evidence of climate change. And more recently, many of them have been involved in anti-vaccine and anti-mask mandates, um, and many promoted disinformation about COVID, uh, like saying it's no worse than the flu, doesn't have a high death rate, stuff like that. In short, if we go back to the beginning of the talk, and look at the National Association of Manufacturers, what we find is they didn't just manufacture cars and carpets, they manufactured a myth. And they and their colleagues would spend the ensuing decades burnishing, it in intellectual, burnishing its intellectual cred credentials and embedding it in politics and popular culture. And in the book, we talk a lot more about how then they embedded in popular culture through the Little House on the Prairie books, through films, television, um, and then bring it into politics through Ronald Reagan. So by this point in the talk, you may be wondering, how do we know that this was propaganda and not legitimate political or academic opinion, legitimate political disagreement? Well, for one thing, Nam and others at the time described it as propaganda themselves. And we found a number of memos, which we quote in the book, where they say, yeah, can we use propaganda? Can we use radio as a form of propaganda to persuade the American people? Can we use television? Um, and they were also, well, we talk about a different episode in the book where the Federal Trade Commission reviewed some of these things and concluded it was propaganda. But for another thing, the key argument was false. That is to say, it's a characteristic of propaganda that it tries to persuade people of things that are either not entirely true or in some cases not true at all. The fact is that the indivisibility thesis, the idea that capitalism by itself somehow protects freedom, is easily refuted by history. Capitalism and freedom are not inseparable. In fact, and in the, the book actually begins with this, this argument, in the early history of capitalism, unregulated markets had produced a world of hurt and suffering a world that was cruel and dangerous and included slavery, the Native American industrial assimilation schools in which Native American children were basically taught not to speak their own languages, not to believe in their own cultures, child labor, including children as young as two years old working in textile mills in Massachusetts, factories that employed children routinely, what William Blake famously called the dark satanic mills, Factories with brutal working conditions, often no light, very bad air, starvation wages, no limits to the hours that workers could be forced to work, and dense air pollution that impacted community health around the factories. And of course, a history of violent suppression of workers when they tried to organize to protect their rights. The accident crisis has been mostly forgotten to history, but in the early 20th century, 
Huge numbers of workers were killed or seriously injured on the job every year. In the 19th century, in the anthracite mining industry, so anthracite coal, 6% of workers were killed every single year. 6%. In 1900, one in every thousand workers were killed on the job in America. So if you figure out what that would be today, it's the equivalent of one and a half million Americans dying on the job every year. So that's, imagine COVID fatalities. That's more than died in the COVID pandemic. So a pandemic of workplace death every single year. And in fact, people at the time compared it to an epidemic. They called it an epidemic of industrial injury. In fact, I did some calculations and concluded that in 1914, it would have been safer for a young man to go fight in World War I than to go work on the railroads or in an anthracite mine. The fact is that American capitalism had not brought freedom to black Americans enslaved in the American South, nor had it protected the legal or political freedoms of female citizens or Native Americans. In fact, but, but, a good deal of this suffering, a good deal of this denial of freedom had been remedied by law and regulation, not all of it by any means, but quite a bit. And it did not lead to totalitarianism. In fact, it arguably strengthened democracy and civil society and protected the freedoms of workers, children, and to some extent, black Americans, although obviously inadequately. The fact is the free market hadn't even protected competition. When markets were unregulated, Competition was often replaced by monopoly. And that's why governments in the late 19th century began to step in to prevent bank panics and to remedy cutthroat competition and monopolistic practices. And the key statute here, of course, was the Sherman Antitrust Act um, implemented under Teddy Roosevelt, which outlawed monopolistic business practices that were designed to undermine free competition. And this passed Congress by overwhelming margins because both Democrats and Republicans recognized in the late 19th century that business left to its own devices didn't actually want competition. What they wanted was to control the market through uh, monopoly. And crucially, it was also recognized that unregulated markets were actually bad for democracy. They didn't protect democracy, they threatened it, because the monopolies and trusts had led to vast accumulations of wealth by people who were known as robber barons, and these robber and barons corrupted both markets and the political system. The Sherman Antitrust Act was explicitly intended to protect democracy against corporations, con corporate concentrations of power and wealth, and that was strengthened in 1914 by the Clayton Act. In fact, by the 1930s, when my story tonight began, various laws had been passed in response to fraudulent and anti-competitive practices to correct market failures, and to protect the innocent and the vulnerable. And I, I did some work to try to figure out, like, what was the first regulation past the United States? Hard to know for sure, and it depends a little bit on your definition of regulation, but in the, in the light of the COVID pandemic, kind of good to remember that in 1809, the state of Massachusetts passed a law mandating vaccination of children, 1809. So we've had mandatory vaccination in this country for a long, long time. Um, for better or worse. But as I've already mentioned, the Sherman Antitrust Act, 1913, the federal income tax to try to remedy the concentration of wealth that had been caused by monopolistic capitalism, the Clayton Act, 1918, passages of the uh, law to protect the eight hour workday. These reforms had not led the United States into Soviet style totalitarianism. On the contrary, nearly all historians would say they made America safer, more equal, and more democratic. And of course, if we think for a few minutes about the Great Depression, if nothing else, the Great Depression proved that the free market did not guarantee prosperity. In fact, reckless financial speculation, reckless pursuit of self-interest, and unscrupulous business practices had played a significant role in the crash of 29. But the New Deal addressed the crisis, and it strengthened American democracy, in part through the creation of the FDIC that I've already mentioned, through the creation of a social security system to protect people from extreme privation, and the, fair, the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, something that almost everybody has forgotten if they ever knew it, that established the 40-hour work week, that if, if factories made you work more than 40 hours, they had to pay you overtime. 
uh, which before that, lots of factory workers would force workers to pay to work without any additional pay, uh, setting minimum wages, and finally, after three decades of debate, outlawing or severely restricting child labor. Now, all of these facts were known to Hayek when he wrote The Road to Serfdom in 1944, and all of these facts were known to Milton Friedman when he wrote Capitalism and Freedom in 1962. But these men brushed these facts aside in pursuit of their political ideology. And in fact, as time went on, the case against capitalism freedom became even stronger. In later years, in 1973, Chile undertook economic liberalization under a brutal dictatorship that reduced freedom. So the dictator Augusto Pinochet violently overthrew a democratically elected socialist government and massively reduced freedom, even as it increased, um, well, increased economic freedom, but massively reduced political freedom. And of course, China today is the textbook example. Since 1978, China has pursued an open door policy that has embraced capitalism, embraced market-based economics, but we have not seen an increase in political freedom along with that. In fact, today, China operates a kind of system that economists have had to come up with a new name for it because nobody knew what to call it at first. And today, many people call it market authoritarianism. Now, of course, in 1962, Milton Friedman didn't know what would happen in Chile or China, but he did know what had already happened in the United States, that American capitalism had not protected freedom, that in fact, workers, consumers, and environmentalists had to fight the American business community to protect their rights and their freedoms, and we're having to fight it again today. So to conclude, and this has been a big talk, so I thank you for staying with me. Market fundamentalism is not restricted to the United States, but it finds its fullest expression and most wide ranging support here. And this, I argue, is neither coincidence nor historical contingency, but the result of a nearly century long propaganda campaign to persuade us of the efficacy and benevolence of markets and the inefficacy and malevolence of big government linked to a corollary insistence on the primacy of markets as protectors of freedom. The reality is that the free market is a theoretical idealization. It has never existed and it never could exist. So the real question facing us is not whether there's a role for governance in the marketplace. Of course there is, there has to be, and history proves that. The real question is how do we define the line? How do we balance competing interests? competing freedoms? How do we balance the desire of a businessman to run his business or her business the way they see fit versus the rights of workers not to be exploited? And how do we address market failures like climate change and remedy them when they occur? And this is what links our new work to our previous work that links this question back to the climate crisis. Because the ideology of the magic of the marketplace, of just letting the market do its magic and telling us we don't need government this ideology stands in the way of addressing many of us our biggest problems. Not too long ago, Klaus, Schwab, Klaus Schwab, the founder and president of the World Economic sorry, the World Economic Forum, came out with a very surprising indictment of market fundamentalism. So this is a man who, by no stretch of the imagination, could be considered a socialist, not even a social democrat. Um, he's a man who has supported tax cuts for the rich and other policies that um, are generally associated with conservative business leaders. But a few years ago, he noted free market fundamentalism has eroded workers' rights and economic security, triggered a deregulatory race to the bottom and ruinous tax competition and enabled the emergence of massive new global monopolies. And we've seen the effect of these monopolies in the United States in social media, in telecommunications, and particularly in agriculture. But I would add to uh, Mr. Schwab's list and the climate crisis, because the climate crisis has been created by our economic system operating as it does, operating legally. Fossil fuels are legal, but the use of those products, the self-interest of those companies in selling these products has led to a massive crisis uh, that now threatens all of our health, our well-being, and our prosperity. Or to put it more succinctly, to use the words of the novelist Kim Stanley Robinson, 
The invisible hand never picks up the check. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so the other thing that I, 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 I kind of was reminded of, you know, related to the climate crisis is that, you know, I used to tell my students, you know, um, so I've been teaching for almost 15 years now, and I used to tell my students, oh, it's probably not you that's going to live through the climate crisis and the major impacts, but it's definitely going to be your children and your grandchildren. Um, and I would give them the case of the disappearing coral reefs and, um, you know, extreme temperature swings. However, this past year, we've experienced that here in California. We had the driest three-year period ever recorded, followed by, uh, and accompanied with a 12-day long heat wave. Thankfully, you missed that one. Uh, but having a young infant child during that period was very stressful. Um, and then we've also had the biggest snowpack of the winter that we've ever seen. Um, so those extreme temperature swings are clear indications uh, that we are living in an era of a different climate compared to the 20th century. Um, so those extreme swings are probably going to just uh, get worse as we go through the century, assuming we don't address this crisis. So thank you. Okay, so now we would like to um, in, um, open the forum up to questions for Dr. Oreskes. Yeah, so we're going to pull up some chairs. Um, there are some microphones around if you want to step up um, and ask questions. Okay, thank you. So I, I know I do know one of my colleagues wants to answer ask a question. I was I'll let her ask it because I had it on my list. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oreskis, for coming here. It's been really enlightening. Um, I wanted to ask. I you know I was just talking about Earth Day with my students today, and one of the things that uh, we talked about is how the environmental movement has faced a deep transformation. And I think we started to see that a little bit like with the sunrise movement, with the global climate strikes. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think the impact of this new era of environmentalism has been in the big myth and um, you know, the, the government's response to climate change? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's, it's a tough one because it's a little bit hard to really you know, know in the moment exactly how th these things are playing out, especially because as a historian, I rely on historical documents, historical evidence to understand how we got to where we are today. But I think one of the key things we're seeing, and we talked about this earlier, is the adoption of ESG, environmental, social, and governance standards by corporations. I think this is a reflection of the fact that the business community is starting to realize, A, that climate change is real, that it's affecting all of us, that it's actually hurting a lot of businesses. I mean, look at the collapse of Southwest Airlines this past winter when we had extreme weather events and their systems were just not able to cope with them. And this is a really important aside. I mean, sometimes people ask me, well, why does climate change matter? And part of the reason it matters is because we live in a world of systems that have been designed to respond to a certain range of conditions. And when things get outside that range, things break down. And so one good example is, you know, the explosion of the shuttle Challenger was because the temperature was outside the range of conditions that the O-rings were designed for. And the shuttle exploded and people were killed. And we saw, you know, that was a very visible tragedy that illustrated this issue of technological systems being designed for a certain range of conditions. So we're seeing that everywhere now, right? Heat waves, droughts, wildfires, you know, firefighters being overwhelmed by fires that are hotter than their equipment is designed to take. So all of these ways in which climate change is affecting us now, and the business community is beginning to respond to that, and the business community knows that their consumers care about this issue. We have a lot of evidence that's the case. So now we're seeing the forces of darkness, and I will call them them that, um, you know, fighting back against ESG standards. And we've seen attorneys generals, attorneys general in some states actually try to outlaw ESG principles. And so this also shows, it makes a mockery of their claim to support free markets, because here's an example where the business community is actually responding to the needs of its 
customers and the desires of its shareholders, and suddenly they say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. So in fact, they do believe in intrusive government when it supports their interests, but they use the ideology of limited government to push back against regulation when it threatens their interests. Um, I have a, qu a, a question, um, and this is related to when we were talking earlier. Um, you know, when you talk about these big corporations, particularly now, they're big and global, uh, and, you know, it feels very intimidating. And, you know, what can we do as an individual, um, particularly to address climate change, uh, particularly for students um, who are just learning about this or who want to do something? Uh, what advice would you have for them in terms of their actions? Well, I think the best advice that was ever given to this question is the advice of Bill McKibben, uh, the activist who was one of the first people to write about this question back in the 80s in um, his famous book, The End of Nature, but also is a founder of 350.org. He says, the most important thing you can do as an individual is don't try to take on this issue as an individual, right? This is a collective active action problem. It's one that requires changes in regulation, changes in law, uh, changes in behavior, and many of those things are best affected when you work in community, when you work together, when you join the Student Senate or the Student Environmental Action Committee or whatever it is, um, because there's, you know, strength, in unity there's strength, and this is a bit of a David and Goliath story. As you said, these corporations like ExxonMobil are incredibly rich, incredibly powerful, and they donate huge amounts of money to uh, mainstream politicians, but you know, how do we get social change? How have we got social change in the past? Well, it's usually through movements. Um, and uh, if you're interested in this question, I recommend Marshall Gantz's famous book, uh, Why David Sometimes Wins, I think is the title. And of course, Marshall Gantz came out of the farm workers union movement here in California. Uh, so it's a great book and really, really helpful and instructive for anyone thinking about how you can make change when the forces aligned against you seem very big. And, all of those have left. and but at the same time, there are also things you can do personally, because I always feel like sometimes people might feel like, well, that feels like too much to take on. So if it is too much to take on right now, or you have a chemistry test to study for, um, reduce the amount of meat you eat. That's one of the single most important things an individual can do that is 100% in your control, um, because meat is a, about depending on whose numbers you use, but about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions are related to agriculture and land use change. And a big chunk of that is meat, particularly beef. And if you look at, there are charts, you probably, maybe you have it, you can show it in class, charts that show the carbon footprint of food. And it's a sort of exponential decay curve where like the carbon footprint of vegetables is almost nothing, not nothing, but very, very low. The carbon footprint of uh, beef is sky high, and then it's like beef, pork, chicken. And interestingly, that parallels what's good for your health, too. I mean, the things with the lower carbon footprint are actually good for your health, much better for your health. So what's good for the planet is also good for you. And that makes me sometimes think there actually really is a God, but that's a different conversation. Um, anyway, and one more thing. In California, because the answer is different in different places, but in California, a huge amount of energy is used to move water uphill. So in California, one of the most effective things you can do and your families can do, and if your families aren't doing it, then talk to your parents, use less water and figure out ways. Like one of the things I did when I lived in San Diego is I ripped out my lawn. This was already 15 years ago. And when we first did it, our neighbors were like, okay, that's weird. And now all of our neighbors have ripped out their lawns. Yeah, that's, that's great advice, and I'm glad I could tell my students something similar. <laughs> um, we have a question over here, though. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, th I'm Lucia Medina, and I just had a question. Speak, or go speak in the, the microphone. Mic. Yeah. Hello, can yeah. you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, uh, so I just had a question. So we use fossil fuels for the majority of our energy production. Uh, what are your thoughts on nuclear power for energy production? Yeah, thanks for that question. So nuclear power is the promise that keeps on receding. So back in the 1950s, when civilian nuclear power was first developed, the scientists and engineers involved said, this is going to be the energy of the future. It's going to be electricity too cheap to meter. We were going to have electric cars, electric planes, electric homes. 
I mean, sorry, nuclear electric cars, nuclear homes. And that never happened. And why it didn't happen is a bit of a complicated problem. But the bottom line is that nuclear power is really, really inherently dangerous. And so you have to spend a lot of money for safety systems. And that makes it a very expensive form of electricity. And those prices have not come down in 70 years of experience. Nuclear power remains the most expensive form of electricity we have in this country today, and that is true around the globe. It has never been cost competitive in a free market system. It's also our most heavily subsidized form of energy. So I don't really get it why people seem to keep turning back to nuclear. It's this sort of promise. I think it is the promise of limitless energy. It's the idea that maybe somehow we don't actually have to change the way we live, that there's this kind of miracle technology that will give us all the energy we want. But we've tested that hypothesis. We've tested it for 70 years, and it hasn't worked in the United States. It hasn't, the only place in the world, um, and I should say it hasn't worked in Japan. There's one exception, and that's France. So France gets about 70 to 80% of its power from nuclear electricity or electricity from nuclear. So that's an important counterexample. But how was that done? How did the French manage to do that? Anybody know? In a nationalized electricity industry, the government owns the electricity industry, exactly the opposite of what the market fundamentalists want. So the question that I sometimes pose to people is, are you prepared for the United States to nationalize the electricity industry? Because that's what it takes to make nuclear power effective. That's what it took in France. And on top of it, it's heavily subsidized. So why would you want to have an industry needs to be heavily subsidized, intrinsically highly unsafe, requires government control of a major sector of the market to work, um, and people don't like it when you have this other alternative that's better, cheaper, and it's here right now because the average time to build a nuclear power plant is about 10 years, and we don't really have that. And so imagine what it would take to build up a whole new cadre of power plants. Um, I mean, I could go on at great length about this because also you really don't want to put power plants in a place where there are earthquakes, as the Fukushima experience shows, which means you really don't want them here in California you know, you could put them in the southwest, but then there's no water. You could put them in the northeast, but then you got millions of people. So it's a really problematic technology. So I think that when people push it, it's based on a dream of a kind of cornucopian world where we don't have to rethink the way we live. Um, I understand why that's attractive, but I really do think it's a false dream. So sorry if you were sympathetic to nuclear and I've crushed it, but um, I really don't think it's realistic. Okay. Yeah, I Thank think you. it's a distraction from the tools that are available now that could really help us fix the problem. Hi, my name is Gracie. Uh, I consider myself an environmentalist. I don't eat meat, um, all those things. Um, but every time that I try and do more research on climate change, I have a lot of anxiety about it. Mm -hmm. And every time that I notice like changes in the weather, I live like a town over and we recently just had snow for the first time ever. And when you experience those things, how do you and other climate scientists deal with the anxiety and frustration yeah. that comes with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for sharing that. Gracie, is yes. that, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate your honesty about that because it is hard. And I think this is one reason why community is so important and not trying to deal with this on your own because the reality is any hard problem, any hard problem, whether it's getting rid of substance abuse or going back to school or whatever it is, I mean, you need support, right? You need the support of your community and you need people who are with you in those moments where you feel like it's hopeless to say, no, it's not hopeless, we can do this together. So I really think that if you don't already have a group of people that you're working with, I would really strongly urge you um, to find community, to find an organization to be working with. And if you are in one and it's not doing the trick, maybe it's a different group. Like maybe the thing is to find, I mean, one thing I often tell people to do is like find your affinity to this problem because one good thing about climate change being such a giant problem, it's probably the only good thing about it, is that whatever you're interested in, there's some angle, right? So if you're interested in food, there's a big food component. If you're interested in ethical treatment of animals, if you're interested in protecting the redwoods, if you love to ski or snowboard, um, protecting winter, like I'm affiliated with Protect Our Winters, which is a small nonprofit that mobilizes the winter sports community to educate people about climate change. So find a group of people who are motivated by the same things that drive you and use that to build a support community. Because, you know, um, 
Alice Walker once wrote that, wrote that resistance is the secret of joy. And I don't know if it's the secret of joy, but it's definitely the secret to not getting depressed. Like feeling that you're doing what you can, you're working with good people, we can make a difference. This is not hopeless, right? Um, I think that's really important. Thank you. Well, hi, this is David. I'm considered a geography major in and, and I, I was thinking about keeping the earth sustainable, like keeping like to pre prevent climate changes from from happening in this world. So, what are your thoughts to keep the earth sustainable in the midst when there's if there's any climate change going on? What's go, what's going through your mind about keeping our planet su sustainable? Well, that's a great question, and it gets to the question of what do we mean by sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I've sometimes been in places where right-wing people will say, oh, it's a word that's thrown around so much it's not even meaningful. And I think that's not right at all. Uh, the Brundtland Commission gave a very clear definition of sustainability many years ago, back in, what, 1980? Was the Brundtland Commission? I've forgotten. A long time ago, before you were born. Um, and they said, a sustainable economy is one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. I mean, in a way, it's similar to the Native American concept of seventh generation, right? To think about how what you're doing here today will either enable or disable enable your children and your grandchildren, and et cetera to meet their own needs. And so that really does require a rethinking of what we're doing right now, because what we're doing now is not sustainable. We're already compromising the ability of people even now to meet their own needs. Um, you know, in Asia where we're seeing water resources greatly impacted, you know, in many parts of the world. So this is where we keep coming back to fossil fuels because the single biggest driver of climate change is the use of fossil fuels. And that's why it's so important for us to think about policies, incentives, you know, both positive and negative carrots and sticks mm -hmm. to move our economy away from the use of fossil fuels. And that can be energy efficiency, it can be electric cars, it can be solar and wind power, um, you know, it can be eating less meat. There's a lot of different things that make a difference. And that's why, again, I say, you know, pick the thing that feels most doable for you. Like, I don't think we, any one of us can do all of these things all at once. Like I have this like checklist for myself. So you know, I got rid of my lawn 15 years ago. I put solar panels on my roof 10 years ago. I decarbonized my retirement portfolio three years ago. Now I'm working on my banking to get out of Bank of America. I did rip up a credit card last week. I mean, it's a process, right? It's not easy to make big changes overnight, but the point is to do as much as we can as fast as we can, because this thing is happening and it's happening now and it's not good. Hello, doctor. Uh, my name is Gustavo. Um, I learned a lot from your um, brilliant um, lecture. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, I wanted to ask for your professional opinion on like regards to overpopulation mm -hmm. with, um, there's like around approximately like 8 billion people on the earth. And um, there's been like a lot of people like um like just like one person like Elon Musk saying oh there's um there's a lot of people but um but sooner or later there'll be like a population decline and um and I think um with regards to like the economy and market fundamentalism that has like a lot to play with um like politics and um like environmental change so um, I just wanted to know like what's your opinion on that does it affect like um like how we use like food or um or should we encourage people to have like more kids or less or or um like what is like the future of tomorrow in terms of like how we um how we teach like the the future generations like how to take care of earth basically yeah and did you say your name is pablo oh no um gustavo gustavo yeah. sorry i couldn't hear you thanks. no worries yeah yeah thanks for the question gustavo well it's a really important question and it's a delicate one it's a complicated one right so for many years i didn't talk about population at all and sometimes people would criticize me for not talking about it but the reason i didn't is this when most people talk about population in most situations particularly like in high level policy circles the focus is all, always on the countries in the world that have very high rates of population growth, places like Nigeria, places like Uganda. But these are not the places that are driving climate change. You know, one 
person from Pakistan uses, has the carbon footprint of something like 80 Americans, right? So if you focus on population growth in the places in the world where population growth is very, very rapid, you're really shifting the attention away from those of us who are responsible to this problem towards people who are really not responsible. And it often degrades into a kind of also blaming women, that stupid, uneducated women in Uganda just have too many children, right? And so, you know, I've, I've tended to resist having a conversation about population because I don't want to participate in a conversation that shifts the blame to people who are in fact not the cause of the problem, right? The people who drive climate change are those of us who live energy and consumptive lives, intent, energy incentive, highly consumptive lives. And that's by and large people in the United States, people in Western Europe, Australia, Japan, and very rich people in countries like India. Although even a rich Indian doesn't generally use as much carbon footprint as like a middle-class American, but some of them do. Just recently, I wrote for the first time in my whole professional life, a piece about population. And of course got slammed because the weird thing about this, this is a case where politics makes strange bedfellows. The market fundamentalists are anti-population control because they're anti-government regulation and because they want us to think that we just let everybody do their things, you know, brilliant individuals will come along and they'll solve the problem. So it's tied up with this cornucopian vision, let the market do its magic, radical individualism, individual rights, it'll all get sorted. But that's not right either. So, so um, there was this piece in the Washington Post just a few weeks ago celebrating the idea that there's 8 billion people on Earth and saying, this is great, because out of these 8 billion people, some genius will come up and will solve the problem. Well, that's even worse, right? In a way, that's even worse than blaming poor people, because it's way, it's like just praying for a miracle. It's the deus ex machina. Anybody here in literature, right? There'll be some kind of miracle. You don't have to do anything now because some genius you know, will come along and fix this problem for us. Wow, that is so wrongheaded. So I wrote a piece in Scientific American saying, this is really wrongheaded. Like if people are driving climate change and people are driving the destruction of our natural environment and people are driving biodiversity loss, which we know they are, then more people is not the solution to that problem, right? And it's a kind of weird, distorted thinking to say we can solve a problem made by people by more people. So that's what I said, but knowing that these people would then immediately accuse me of hating black people, um, I said in my column, I said, however, this is a sensitive issue because there's a long history of discussion of population control as basically being an excuse to oppress you know, women and people of color. And so that's not what I'm saying. And in fact, one of the things we know is that if you really, have, if you care about, so if you care about climate change, you have to look at consumption in rich countries. If you care about the welfare and well-being of poor people, then yes, population control is important, but then you have to really look at educating women because we have lots and lots of evidence that shows that if you would like to help people in Uganda or Pakistan or you know wherever, the best thing you can do is to provide education for girls. And many of these countries, that's not happening. Many of these countries, there's no public education. Like in most of Africa, people have to pay to go to school. So if you have very little money, very hard to find the money to send your children to school. So these right-wing market fundamentalists immediately got on social media, see, Oreskes is a Malthusian, we knew it all along. And of course, that's a complete distortion of the argument. But so this is why it's, it's hard to talk about population uh, because it is a complicated issue. It has many components, but at the end of the day, it is part of the problem, but it's not the main driver of climate change. And I think that's the point I always wanna come back to. Um, it is a significant driver of habitat destruction and biodiversity loss in some parts of the world. And so that's why it is important that we don't not discuss it at all. So slightly long answer to your question, but it's because it's an important and complicated oh, one. Thank you. I appreciate so thank you, Gustavo. Mm -hmm. So, so I really appreciate all the um, student questions. And so uh, everyone that's in line will kind of stop there. Um, just be oh, yeah. Come in and join. <laughs> I'll try to keep my answers shorter so we can get through more questions. Okay, I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, my name's Catherine, thank you for coming. Um, 
I didn't get a chance to see your movie, so I'm not sure what your answer is to this question. It may be a two-parter, but um, so originally my um, major was environmental conservation and then um, through making laws, right? Making um, changes through governmental, I mean, overreach, I suppose. But then it kind of shifted because we, we have the information, we have the knowledge of it, but there's still cognitive dissonance. So now I want to kind of switch into um, psychology and figure out why are we still fighting the facts and things like that. So my question is, um, what do you think the actual solution is? Because people are, always have their self-interest um, in mind, even when they see long-term, it's going to be, you know, you know, be bad for everyone. So how do we, and, and then also the part of like, you know, I don't want to say the Republican Party, but they're actually a, min, a minority, but their voice is as if it's a my majority, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. So I'll try to give a short answer. So one of the things I try to, my, uh, to do in my work is to point out that we have been saturated with disinformation on this right. question. And so one good thing about that is we can be compassionate towards our friends and family members and neighbors who are you know, think that masks don't work or that uh, vaccines are not safe or whatever it is or the climate's not changing because they have been the victims of massive amounts of disinformation. And one of the things we know from social science research is that if you just say to people, oh, the climate really is changing, that often is not effective. But if you can show people that this is disinformation, that this is actually a con game, that actually often will wake people up because nobody wants to be a sucker, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the short answer to this question. To the extent that we can expose the disinformation for what it is, to say, look, you know, Fox News has been lying to you just like they lied about the election, and the courts have just said it, and they're paying $800 million? Yeah, eight hundred million million because they lied about it. Um, that, can be, that can be a powerful argument. Mm. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, hi, doctor, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Richard. I just had a quick question. You talked a little bit about like um, market fundamentalists galvanizing people like intellectuals and stuff like that and, and finding different ways to disseminate information, but then also like watering down some of the information to kind of be able to manipulate it and use it how they will. My question kind of relates to the previous one. Um, who do you think is responsible for or are there people that you know of currently that are like, um, who's responsible for using kind of some of that, that, that dense science that the climate scientists are doing and like being able to make it more palatable, but then also kind of using that information in the opposite direction, using that information mm -hmm. like to support uh, climate, climate action and like climate science and like sort of con the con, so to speak, you get what I'm saying? So like use, um, I, I don't want to say to kind of almost create more propaganda, but in a sense, oh, like, yeah. to, because, you know, the science is so dense and, and we, yeah, we use science to combat disinformation, but it's like, you know, people yeah. have to understand. It. Yeah, no, I, I see where you're going with that question. It's a really good question. So thanks, Richard, for that. So it is a tricky thing. And I sometimes get asked that question. So should we fight propaganda with propaganda? Uh, no, 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 definitely not. You know, I don't want to just be the evil that I'm fighting, right? That's, I don't see how that's a good strategy. But you're absolutely right. One of the challenges is that, uh, first of all, these people, we know they've spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on disinformation. So it's an extremely unlevel playing field. So again, we can have compassion for scientists who have, you know, they've really been fighting a David versus Goliath kind of fight. But that said, I do think that the scientific community has been, um, a little too reluctant maybe to take off the gloves, if I can put it that way, right? I mean, this is a fight and it is a political fight and we have to acknowledge that. You know, I've been, I, I was trained as a scientist originally. I taught in science departments. Some of my best friends are scientists. And, and one of the things I've seen over the years is that a lot of scientists, even when they saw what was going on, they didn't really want to engage. It was like, well, it's politics, it's messy, it's dirty. I like facts. I like numbers. I don't want to, you know, degrade myself by getting down in the mud. I don't want to dumb it down. This is complicated. People can't understand it. I mean, like a lot of excuses, some good, not so good, not to be involved. And I frankly think that's a luxury that we can't afford any longer. And I think the good news is we have seen the scientific community 
step up to the plate a lot more in the last few years. There are big, big changes to what's going on now compared to say, you know, when I was in grad school. When I was in grad school, faculty would tell students in no uncertain terms, yeah, you this is that's politics. You can't get involved in that. My message is that the whole idea that we can I feel like if my work proves anything, it's that the idea that science is over there and politics is over there and you can just do science and not worry about the politics. No, I mean, the politics is coming to you whether you like it or not, yeah. right? So you better figure out some strategy for dealing with it. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Elias. I have a question regarding the Willow Project. Sure. Can you try to keep your face to the microphone? So yes. Otherwise, I won't be able to hear you. Yes. Uh, so I was asking, what are the uh, potential environmental impacts of the Willow Project and how it can impact, like, what are the effects for our Earth? Yeah, that's a great question. I have to say, I am really angry <laughs> about the Biden administration decision. I mean, Biden has done a lot of good things. The Inflation Reduction Act was complicated and it was a mixed bag, but it was way more good than bad. And it was a really big step in the right direction. Because one of the things I feel really strongly about politics and about life is that whenever you're facing a big problem, it's really important to start, right? To move in the right direction. And even if the initial steps are small, even if the initial steps are faltering, because politics particularly builds on momentum. And once you start doing the right thing, you can help build your coalitions. And so Biden really shifted, you know, the ship of state in a big way with the Inflation Reduction Act. It's the first really serious large piece of environmental legislation we've had in this country in, you know, decades. So it was a giant step forward. Willow is a big step back and it undermines the momentum and I think it has really disillusioned a lot of young people who are feeling like, okay, I can be on board. I can support, you know, the Democratic Party's a little conservative in a lot of ways, not necessarily on board on all the issues I wanted to be on board on, but, you know, I can support them. So I think Willow is a big step backward. I don't understand why the president did it, except I'm thinking he owed Lisa Murkowski a uh, you know, a favor. I don't know. There's some internal politics there, but I also think this. So I used to be friends with the former governor of Oregon, Governor Kulingowski. And one time he said to me, well, whatever the most cynical interpretation of is of a political decision, that's probably the right one. So here's what I think. I actually think, and the more I think about this, the more I'm thinking this might be true. I think that Biden thinks that Will, Will, Willow will actually never go ahead because here's the thing. It's going to be fought in court. There's going to be all kinds of lawsuits against this for all kinds of reasons. And so I think he thinks this will be tied up in lawsuits for the next 20 years. And by the time it gets sorted, they won't want to drill there anyway. Um, so if any of you, you know, people were asking, what can I do? If any of you are interested in joining the, you know, the, there's the Children's Trust Movement, which is young people across the country bringing lawsuits on the basis of their rights to... Um, a safe future. And the initial children's trust case has not gone super well in court. They've had some wins, some losses, but this new case in Montana is moving ahead rather briskly because it turns out that the Montana state constitution guarantees the right to a safe environment. And this is giant. So um, maybe help out those kids in Montana. And the, I mean, they're young. Like I met actually, I was at Harvey Mudd earlier this week. I met one of the young people who is one of the um, plaintiffs in that case, she's like 21, um, or give money to it or just send them an email and express moral support. Getting back to the question we had earlier, moral support really matters. Like you may feel like, okay, I don't have the time. I don't have any money. Uh, but you know, like I sometimes get emails from people and I'm in a pretty good position. You know, I make a pretty good salary at Harvard. I can't complain. Um, but you know, occasionally I'll get an email just from some random person who says, oh, I heard you talk, or I read Merchants of Doubt, or we saw the movie in class, and it just made, it made such a difference to me. Or sometimes professors will say, I'm teaching my class differently now because of what I learned from you. And that's like, it doesn't just make my day, it makes my week, it makes my month. I mean, because all of us who are in this space, we need to know that what we're doing is making a difference. So that's like a small thing that you can do as an individual, right? You know, reach out and support someone who's doing some work that you respect or admire.
Um, so there are a bunch of people who are going to be fighting Willow for sure, and they will need all the support that you can give them. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello, um, my name is Jules. Um, so given that we all kind of exist in a, um, a an environment of rampant like overconsumption, um, largely mobilized by um, the accessibility to social media, um, I've seen a just kind of this phenomenon of these massive corporations um, because uh, voices have been mobilized this sort of like direct connection between the public and the corporate world um, and this sort of sense of um, accountability that comes with that um, with the utilization of social media and then this uprising of kind of disingenuous um, eco-friendly greenwashing type of you know, marketing on, I mean, what it is, is marketing. Right. So how do you feel, how much truth do you feel is behind those claims of like, you know, zero emotion, zero emission, you know, um, how much, how much fact is, is truly behind that? And do you think that, I mean, to me, it just rings as really disingenuous and unproductive and, um, dishonest. Yeah. So, well, I agree. I think most of it is bogus yeah. and especially, I mean, but sometimes it can be hard to know for sure, but here's one way to, to think about it. So I'm always looking for tells. Um, one of the things I love the best about the movie version of Merchants of Doubt is that this wonderful magician, Jamie Ian Scott agreed to work with us because part of what we're arguing is this is a game of smoke and mirrors, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of this is distraction, right? It's what magicians call misdirection. How do magic tricks work? Almost all magic tricks work through misdirection, which is to say, you know, so I'm really interested in you, Jules. Talk to me. And while I do that, I pull the coin out of my back pocket or whatever. And you don't right. even notice because I've distracted you. And Jamie did us this great favor. If you haven't seen the film, it's worth watching because it's so fun. Mm -hmm. He allowed us to see one of his tricks. Like, you know, magicians never re reel their tricks. Um, so he has this card trick where the card like pops up under a glass. And when he shows it to you later, you can't even believe it. I and mean, this is in the film, so you can all see it. I mean, he just puts the card under the glass. He just puts it there. I mean, there's no real trick at all. And no one notices because he's so effective in distracting you, you know, with the eye contact, with the right. hand movements, the ribbons, the rabbit in the hat, whatever it is. Okay. Right. So a lot of this stuff is misdirection. Mm -hmm. The most obvious tell is basically when someone is trying to buy you something, right. buy this handbag, you know, and for every a hundred handbags we, you buy, we give three cents to some person in Uganda, right? <laughs> I mean, that is obviously crap. And the idea that you can solve the problems of consumption with more consumption, it gets back to, we can't solve the problem of population with more people. Right. And I think you see this a lot here in the Southern California, because of all these celebrities mm -hmm. that are now doing this because they can be, you know, they can be, because now it's like every celebrity has to have a cause. Have you noticed this? Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, a celebrity was just a celebrity. Now every celebrity has a cause, right? And whether it's malaria or I don't know, taking care of animals. So, most of this is bogus. Yeah. And I think anything that's encouraging you to consume with the idea that you could sort of ease your conscience because there's some little crumbs being thrown in the direction of conservation is mostly bogus. Now, that said, there are some companies like, you know, Patagonia recently announced they're yes. like changing their whole business model. Um, I've been in conversation with, um, it's a window manufacturer in Denmark. 80% of their profits go to their nonprofit foundation that's fighting climate change. So 80%, compare that to the 1% for the planet, right? I mean, there's like the penny or there's 80%. Now, we don't live in Denmark, so we can't buy their windows. But, but there are some companies out there who are actually trying to shift their business models. They're rare. Um, they're hard to find, but increasingly, like, you know, Patagonia made this giant announcement. You nodded your head. You knew about that. Yes. So yeah. there are some of them out there. There are things. Um, electric cars are better, irrespective of what we think about Elon Musk. <laughs> and I am worrying that I think there's something like a little weird going on at SpaceX when that spaceship exploded oh and they all God. cheered. I just saw that. I know. It's like totally crazy. So apparently they were cheering because of how far it got. <laughs> okay. I mean, I kind of get that, but I kind of don't. So anyway, the point is 
there is some work to be done there. The easiest way to deal with it is just to say, I'm going to do my best to try to buy less. I was just talking to someone this morning who got off Amazon and I was like, that's impressive because yeah. it's hard, right? We've mm -hmm. all come to rely on Amazon. She goes, well, the good news is you immediately buy less. That's and then she true. admitted she slightly cheated because she occasionally uses her husband's account. <laughs> so, okay, there's leakage, but that's all right. You know, if you still move in the right direction. <laughs> Just have right? a little consumption cheat day. <laughs> a little consumption cheat, yeah. Anyway, right. I should take the last question and then we Thank need you to so wrap much. up. But Thank yeah, you. great to meet you, Jules. Thanks for coming today. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is Wodarek. First, before I post my question, permit me to express my great appreciation to Dr. Umano. Dr. Umano attended his class of oceanography. I can describe him as a man of extra wit and intelligence, his brain power of teaching, and I was greatly impressed. Dr. Umano, before I start my program, I may join your class again. You really flattened me, and you made me love this calling. <laughs> Now, my question is this. <clears throat> the geopolitics is taking center stage and the little baby called the climate change is a threat. Oh, the major emitter, China, was negotiated by my brother Obama and he came to the negotiating table and they worked what we call the Paris Accord. Recently, when I heard the news, given the kind of politics, all these countries are coalescing around Russia even my, I'm from Africa, people, my countries from Africa are also now trying to coalesce around Russia. Yesterday, I think about two days ago, I saw watching news, they have been cropped the India in, India, one of those are the major emitters. The South Africa is in, and other countries are also following. The little young boy of Yang Kim of North Korea is also playing his game. All this, they are coalescing around Russia. And the West, with the US and the Europe are on this side. The little baby climate change is under threat. Who can bring these folks together? I heard President <laughs> Trump say that the World War Three is looming. So who can bring this? Because if they pull out of the negotiating table and we go back, how will it be? I put that, that's the first question. The so second question, I like, if, if I didn't, I can still preach. The second question I, I would like to ask is that in America, the, the best state who has launched a very ambitious ambition, a very ambitious fight to deal with climate change is our beautiful state, California. I'm proud of our governor, Newsom, given what he has laid out. I'm told that by the year 2030, we need like at least 90% people, we switch to electric cars. But given the population of California and many cars, like one person even has like five cars. If you are traveling, Chile, now we are facing summer. You know, for two years, people didn't travel because of COVID. So now people will be traveling. When people will travel from all the way from North San Francisco, going to San Diego, where the, the charging points, how you call it charging stations, yeah. what is the ambitious plan the government put in place? Yeah. Because I'm told for you even to charge that car, I've traveled all the, I've driven all the way to San Francisco and I stopped somewhere, I feel like 10 minutes, I'm done. And I'm told, therefore, you to charge that electric car, satisfactorily, it must take like about 30 minutes to one hour. So what are the measures the government put in place to address all this? Because this will be like a challenges and we don't want anything which can become like a hiccup in fighting this dragon called climate change. We love our mother earth. Thank yeah, you very much, that, Professor. That's a great question. Thank you for that. So I'll take the second question first. So this is a really, really good example of why we need the government and we even need big government, right? Because then it gets back to this question about what I can do as an individual. So I can buy an electric car, but if I can't charge it and I can't get where I need to go from San Francisco to San Diego or whatever, then it doesn't really do me the work I needed to do. And I can buy a car, but I can't build my own charging infrastructure, right? So this is where we need government, big government, organized government to organize the infrastructure just as the government built the highway system in the first place, little known or remember fact, just as the government created the original electricity grid, we need to recapitulate those success stories from the past, and they are success stories, and remind people that Actually, governments can be very effective in doing many things. We've been saturated with this 
this story about government waste. And, you know, I didn't talk about Ronald Reagan tonight, but he's a big player in the story, of course, and in the book we discuss him. You know, Reagan had this mantra that government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem, and that's just false. Government isn't the solution to all our problems, but it is the solution particularly the problems of infrastructure. And Adam Smith talks about this in The Wealth of Nation. So this is a classic infrastructure uh, problem, and we need to support politicians who are willing to go to bat for infrastructure. And it can be hard because sometimes people say, oh, I don't actually want that charging station. I mean, charging stations are relatively low impact. It comes up more with like big wind farms and solar panels. And of course, the fossil fuel industry is exploiting that now. Fossil fuel industry is now funding anti-wind power groups, doing the astroturf thing, pretending they're saving whales. It's a big mess. So it's really, really important that as citizens, we support these big infrastructure projects. Um, back to your first question, that was a harder one. Who's gonna bring all the diverse groups together? Um, yeah, well, that's a tricky one because we could wait for the Martin Luther King of climate change or the Gandhi of climate change and I think some people thought Greta Thunberg maybe was, is that? I don't know. She certainly mobilized a lot of people in Europe. Um, but I think that, you know, we can't wait. It's like we can't wait for the genius to be born out of the 8 billion on the planet. But there's so much that can be done by people working together on the state level and or, the, or even like African communities joining forces. One of the reasons I feel proud to call myself a Californian, and I still think of California as home, I still have my home in San Diego with that ripped up lawn, um, is because California has been a leader on the climate issue. And California was a leader before that in pollution control in general. And California has been a leader on popular culture. I, I know we need to wrap up, but I have to just tell a very quick fun story. Many years ago, I taught at NYU in a program, the Gallatin School of Individualized Studies, where the students were allowed to do anything they wanted. They just had to come up with a course of study, and they had to get it approved by their faculty advisor. So, and our students were just assigned to us. So the student comes to me, and he's kind of disaffected. He's kind of like not really getting good grades, and so not really sure what to do. So I say to him, what are you interested in? And he says, hip-hop music. This is like 25 years ago. And I say, what's that? Because <laughs> I had no idea. And it's a happy ending story. We got him an internship with Sony Records. He moved to California. He became an executive at MTV and has had a great life. And he emailed me years later to thank me. And I said, good, give, make a donation to your university now. Anyway, so the point is, California is a leader in culture. It's a leader in science, aerospace. This state has led America on so many things. And when California does something, other states follow. So what happens here is super important. So even if it may feel frustrating, even if it feels like it's too slow, even if there are setbacks, um, it is really important what happens here in California. And that's one reason that I'm glad to be here today and to celebrate Earth Week with you. And that's a good place to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. <laughs> um, I'm so glad to have you all here and stick around uh, for the Q&A. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes outside. Um, if you have a book that uh, you would like Dr. Reskis to sign, um, we're going to, uh, where's Tyler? Oh, are we outside? Or OK, so yeah, we'll be out in the lobby um, at the table there. Uh, so please join us. And you know, you can come by and say hi to Dr. Reskis as well. And yeah, 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 out there. And um, thank you for all the good student questions. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and it's nice to know that you all have uh, really thought about this. And uh, again, uh, thanks for joining us.